This short lecture, entitled The Authorship of the World, was given at the Sophia University Commencement Ceremony on June the 22nd. At the heart centre of each human is a fiery imagination wishing to make sense out of no sense and paint the self in the best possible light. Sentience, wherever and whenever it manifests, peers into the mirror like a young narcissus and asks itself the following questions. Who am I? How did I come to be? Do I live in a world of eternal feasibilities? Or am I shackled by gross limitations? What are the social, moral and ethical codes of conduct that govern behaviour and society as a whole? What are the consequences of lawmaking and lawbreaking, of conformity and dissension? The scaffolds most integral to human development are transmitted through oral and literary devices called narratives, and more explicitly myths. They represent our greatest failures and successes, everything we have been, are, aspire to be, and will be. Mythology is the intergenerational template through which we create and recreate our worlds, the tool we use to construct, deconstruct and reconstruct ourselves across contiguous eras. And despite being temporally and culturally bound, myths speak to us and play with our heartstrings in an impartial and indiscriminate manner. The antediluvian allegory of Atlantis, for instance, cleverly implies that the destruction of the old precedes generation of the new. In a time before this, King Minos of Crete imprisoned the Minotaur, the theriomorphic son of Queen Pacify, in a subterranean labyrinth. We, too, imprison our instinctual drives, our sadomasochistic and destructive impulses, within a socially mediated pattern art that can restrict self-definition and self-expression. Jason, the legendary Greek hero, once embarked on a dangerous quest to Colchis to capture a priceless treasure known as the Golden Fleece. Is this not a figurative expression of the intrinsic rewards that come from risk-taking behaviour and having the chutzpah to venture beyond one's own comfort zone or map territory? The Egyptian Isis is inexorable in her plight to gather the scattered parts of her dismembered brother-husband, Osiris. Like Isis, life equips us with ample opportunities to become whole again by gathering back dismembered parts of ourselves that weren't mirrored, validated, or celebrated. Not all our stories are benign or noble, though. Like the vengeful sorceress Circe, we can direct the full brunt of our jealousy at a lover when we are no longer the preferred object of their desirousness. King Midas underscores the idea that some people are harbingers of serendipity. However, what gold can come good of wishing if it is barren of common sense? We can be furtive and disingenuous in pursuit of our selfish agendas. Disguised as a femme fatale, Isis confronts her brother Seth on an island and tells him that a stranger entered her life after the death of her husband, intent on stealing domestic possessions and banishing her young son from the household. Without thinking, Seth reproaches the foreigner for the same injustice which he was attempting to commit against little Horace, and in doing so, unwittingly confesses his own depravity. Knowledge, my friends, is power, and we are perpetually conflicted as to whether we should use it for personal gain or altruistic ventures beneficial to society as a whole. A long time ago, Isis blackmailed the sun god Ra by poisoning him with a serpent made from his own spittle and then agreeing to heal him on condition that he reveal his secret name to her. These are the dark, less than honourable shadows pervading the human spirit. Finally, we do not have omnipotent control over the environment, nor are we impermeable to calamity. Like Icarus, whose wings were melted by the sun's heat because his father's reasoning fell on deaf ears, our lofty ambitions and hubris may be levelled at any moment. The universe punishes grandiosity and shatters illusions of cosmic supremacy.
In a Coptic version of the Gnostic myth of Bistis Sophia, the goddess appears before her arrogant son, Ealdabaoth, and utters a spine-chilling prophecy. There is an immortal man of light who has been in existence before you, and who will appear among your modelled forms. He will trample you to scorn just as the potter's clay is pounded, and you will descend to your mother, the abyss, along with those that belong to you. Arrogance, it seems, is not aligned with the fundamental harmony of the universe. To further complicate matters, tragic socio-political consequences can ensue from mythographical detail. Eve, according to the biblical account of Genesis, is fashioned by Jehovah Elohim from the rib of Adam. She is a second and inferior creation, and it is she whom tempted Adam to taste of the forbidden fruit. Similarly, in the Christian tradition, Patriarchal bias and appreciation of the masculine gender over the feminine crops up in both semantic language and in societal conventions which have underpinned Eurocentric consciousness for millennia. In the wake of the 21st century, our most empowering myths have receded from you, caught in an occult backwash caused by the post-reformation waves. And what have these waves brought us but school after school of dogmatic approaches to absolute knowledge, Newtonian mechanics, Darwinian natural selection, evolutionary psychology, behaviorism with its controversial agenda of reducing all human interactions to the level of basic reflexes and conditioned responses, biological psychiatry with its aim to identify biomarkers for mental illness, and cognitive neuroscience with its embodied mind hypothesis. Myths preserving memories of human divinity and giftedness, the unharnessed powers of will and belief, and a mother nature enchanted and inspirited have all been forgotten or relegated to the dustbin of pseudoscience. This disenchantment of nature has saturated the clinical disciplines and consequently most ailments, organic and psychiatric, aren't treated in the context of the whole. Instead of treating the patient from within a holistic framework as an active dynamic member of a socio-cultural system replete with an assumptive worldview, conflicting motivations and psycho-spiritual leanings, clinicians adopt unconscious philosophical attitudes where the central premise is that what's walked into the room is a bundle of psychobiological impulses with defects that must be fixed with surgery, somatic-based therapies and polypharmacy. Perhaps, then, the way forward is illuminated by the Gnostic text on the origin of the world, wherein Pistis Zoe, daughter of the goddess Pistis Sophia, stumbles upon the lifeless carcass of Adam. Overwhelmed by grief and pity for her male counterpart, she breathes the divine spark into him with the help of her mother. Adam, she shrieks, become alive, rise upon the earth. The divine element moves with him, like a slithering serpent, and imbues him with life. Perhaps then, for a modern myth to nurture and actualize human potential, it must retain an unconditional positive regard for the aesthetically feminine. Mutuality, trust, vulnerability, playfulness, and curiosity, all integral foundations of true love. Pluralism, intentionality, intellectual synergy, intuition, egalitarianism, and a humble, modest, yeah-based empiricism. It must promote deepest meaning-making and remain diametrically opposed to judgment, separation, and hierarchy. These are the qualities that move mountains and occasionally create them. Despite being far from that promised land, we cannot lose hope. Yes, we must remain resolute and undaunted in our plight to get there. Remember, no gold has ever come good of doubting. You, the graduates of Sophia University and mortal children of Pistis Sophia, whose name means faith wisdom in Greek, are now tasked with this sacred duty.